Hello everyone, Nicola here. In this video, we will continue with the dynamic programming series. If you haven't seen my previous video on dynamic programming, make sure to watch that first because this video builds on those ideas. I often get comments that dynamic programming is only for interviews and it has no practical value. This is why I decided to look at two real life problems that all of you use on a daily basis. First one is git diffing algorithm, which uses a variation of the longest common subsequence. And the second one is justify text alignment used in Google Docs or Microsoft Word. We will also see how to find the full solution path, not just the optimal number like in part one. Today, we will talk about the longest common subsequence and we will explore the text alignment problem in the next one. By the end of this video, we will write a program that reads two text files and prints the diff between them. Let's get started. You are given two text files, A and B. Your task is to find differences between them. Specifically, we want to find the smallest number of lines to remove from and add to the file A to match the contents of file B. But before we solve this problem, let's start with a more basic task. Given two sequences of numbers A and B, we need to find the longest common subsequence. What do we mean by the longest common subsequence? Sequence is simply an array of integers, for example, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Subsequence is also an array of integers, but it is obtained by deleting some or possibly zero elements from the original sequence. For example, if we delete 3 and 5, we get a sequence 1, 2, and 4, so we say 1, 2, and 4 is a subsequence of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. However, note that 3, 2, 1 is not a subsequence of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, because we can't obtain it only by deleting elements. What about common? We say that a subsequence is common for two arrays if it's a subsequence of both. Imagine that we have two integer arrays, a equals 1, 2, 3, 4, and b equals 2, 3, 4, 5. Would you say that a sequence 1, 2, 3 is a common subsequence for these two arrays? It is a subsequence of a because we can obtain it by deleting 4. But it is not a subsequence of b because 1 doesn't exist in b. So this is not a common subsequence. Common subsequences are sequence 2, 3, sequence 2, sequence 3, or even an empty one. Notice that these sequences have different lengths. Longest refers to the common subsequence which has the most elements. In this case, that's the sequence 2, 3. For completeness, let's look at another example. Say that we have sequences A and B as shown on the screen. What is the longest common subsequence here? Let's list all common subsequences first. Hopefully, I didn't miss some. But you can see that the number of possible subsequences quickly grows. In this example, the longest common subsequence is 4, 5, 9, 11, and its length is 4. So, how do we find the longest common subsequence for the two arrays? What if we start from each element in the array A, find the corresponding element in the array B, and repeat the process for the remaining elements? One doesn't exist in array B, so we skip it. 4 exists in both, so we can select it. 5 exists too. 6 exists in both, but is before the elements that we've already included in the solution, so we can't pick it. That's okay, let's keep going. This approach selects numbers 4, 5, 9, and 11, which are indeed the longest common subsequence. This seems to work, but what if we swapped the arrays A and B and applied the same algorithm again? We would have chosen elements 6, 9, and 11, which are clearly not the longest common subsequence, so this greedy approach doesn't work. This is the point when we should start thinking about dynamic programming because the solution asks us to find the optimal length, and there are clearly some issues with the basic greedy approach. Of course, this is not enough for a problem to require dynamic programming, but these are some signals that suggest we should explore the possibility. When I try to solve a problem that may require dynamic programming, I often start with defining a subproblem such that subproblems are overlapping in some sense. Then I try to find the relationship between subproblems. Let's try to do that. One potential subproblem of a single array could be any subsequence. Unfortunately, there are too many subsequences, to be specific, 2 to the power of n for an array with n elements. So this doesn't feel like the best way to go. At this point, I'd probably explore other options and come back to this one if I can't find anything better. Another way to represent subproblems is to consider continuous parts of the arrays. There are n to the 4 subproblems that we have to solve. 
This is much better than option 1, but let's keep going. We could also consider all prefixes or all suffixes. These are equivalent, so I'll just consider prefixes. There are n prefixes for each array, so the total number of subproblems is n squared. It's not always clear where to start, but I like to start with the smallest number of subproblems I can think of because the relationship between subproblems tends to be simpler, if it exists. Also, time complexity is likely to be better for fewer subproblems. If this doesn't work out, I usually realize that some key information is missing, which gives me an idea for what a subproblem should be. These are just guidelines, of course, and may not work every time, but I still apply them to most problems. I can't think of other options for this task, so let's start with the approach where a subproblem L of nm represents the longest common subsequence for the first n elements of the array A and the first m elements for the array B. For example, L of 5, 3 would be a solution for the highlighted subproblem in the screen. So, how can we compute the solution for L of nm? This is the hard part, and it relies on identifying key insights about the subproblem. Let's go back to our example. Let's imagine that we are solving a subproblem with five elements from the first array and three elements from the second one. Since we are talking about prefixes, we should think about relation with subproblems involving the last element because removing it gives us a smaller prefix, which is a smaller subproblem. Let's look at the last elements in both arrays, which are at positions A of 4 and B of 2 in this example. There are two cases. These two numbers can be different, or they can be equal. The first case is easy. If the elements are different, like 9 and 5 in this example, then clearly we can't choose both, because these are the last elements in the subproblem. The common subsequence can finish with 9 or 5, but not with both. However, we don't know which one is not in the final solution. We know that at least one is not in the final solution, and it could be both. Luckily, assuming that we have solved smaller subproblems, then we know what's the best solution if either of the two elements are removed. So we can check both solutions and choose the better one. We are trying to maximize the length, so we will take the maximum of the two solutions. Now let's look at the second case where the last elements are equal. This one is a bit trickier, but let me try to explain my thought process. In the first case, we said that at least one element is not in the longest common subsequence because they are different. Now that they are the same, maybe both elements are in the final solution. If both elements are in the final solution, then we can include both and solve the remaining subproblem. In that case, L of n m would be 1 plus L of n minus 1 m minus 1. 1 is for including the element, which extends the longest common subsequence by 1. But how can we prove that the last two elements are in the longest common subsequence if they're the same? If none of them were in the final solution, then we could make the common subsequence longer by picking them. That seems obvious. But what if only one of these was in the final solution? For example, what if 9 from A should be matched with some earlier 9 from B in our example? Well, in that case we are not using any numbers after the paired 9 in array B, so it doesn't matter if we choose that one or the last one. Hopefully this convinces you that including both elements is the optimal choice here. If this is still not clear, I highly recommend you pause the video, try to prove this yourself, and then rewatch this part again. Finding the relationship between subproblems is the hardest part in dynamic programming, so don't worry if this doesn't come to you immediately. It takes time to build intuition, and even then it can be hard to find the right approach. On some days, I can solve problems quickly, while some other times I can't solve simple ones. Let's go back to our problem. All that's left is to figure out the base case. Longest common subsequence of some sequence and an empty sequence is always zero, so this will be our base case. Let's implement the solution. I'll use C++ for this example. First, we initialize the two-dimensional array and set each element to zero. This will cover our base case. I'm calling this dp, but it corresponds to the function l. Note that we need one extra element in each dimension, because we need to represent empty prefixes. We then iterate over smaller subproblems first. Remember the lesson from the first video. It's important to solve subproblems in topological ordering. If the last elements are the same, we can take them. Otherwise, we take the better solution after skipping one or the other. Finally, we can return the length of the longest common subsequence. Notice that the solution is quite simple, even though it took some time to figure out how to do it. This is often the case with dynamic programming problems. Let's run this on a couple of tests. 
All these seem to work. Great. You may be wondering how this can help us find the difference between two text files. After all, we only know the length of the longest common subsequence, which is not very useful on its own. It would be better if we could find which elements are part of the longest common subsequence. How can we do that? It's not always possible to reconstruct the solution without storing additional information. We will explore such problems in future videos. Fortunately, it's easy to reconstruct which elements are in the longest common subsequence given the DP matrix that we've computed already. The idea behind reconstruction is to start from the final solution and visit subproblems that lead to the optimal answer. Let's go back to our example. The final solution is L of 7, 5. The element 11 is the same in both arrays at indexes 6 and 4, so we know it's in the longest common subsequence. Let's store it and go to the previous subproblem. 9 and 10 are different. We know that the solution is 3 for this subproblem, so all we need to do is follow the path that resulted in 3. That can only happen if we keep 9 and drop 10. Let's do that. Notice that some examples may have multiple solutions, in which case dropping either of the elements results in the optimal solution. Let's keep going. Now we have the same situation where the element 9 is the same for both arrays, so we keep it. You get the idea. We store the element if it's the same and reverse engineer the original process until we reach the base case. This process gives us the longest common subsequence, but it's reversed, so we have to fix that as well. Now let's implement all of this. We have already computed the DP matrix, and we know the values of arrays A and B, so these will be the parameters for the reconstruct elements function. We start from the final subproblem and keep the element if it's the same in both arrays, then go back to the next subproblem. If dropping an element from the array A leads to a better solution, we go to the next subproblem by decrementing i, and otherwise we decrement j. Note that in this implementation we drop the element from the array B if there are multiple solutions, which in practice means we chose the rightmost element from the array A. Since we've added the elements in the reverse order, let's reverse them to get the actual one. Let's also run this on a couple of tests. This works for the basic case, when one of the sequences is empty, when both are empty, when they're both the same, and also when there are multiple solutions, showing that we keep the rightmost element from the array A. Great, everything seems to work as expected. We are now ready to find the difference between two text files. I've created two simple C++ files to test our solution. First, let's run the git diff command to get an idea of the output we want to get. Lines starting with minus are deleted, and lines starting with plus are added to the file A, and applying these changes results in file B. Let's implement a function print differences that takes lines for each file. Reading lines from a file is trivial, so I won't go into these details. If you're curious, you can check out the code which I'll link in the description below. The key idea is to find the longest common subsequence of the two files, where each element is a string representing a line. Our implementation only works with integers, but it's very easy to change it to work with strings or any type that provides equality check. In C++, we can use templates to implement this for a generic element t. OK, now we know the longest common subsequence of lines for the two files. How can we use this to print the differences? The idea is to start with the first line in the longest common subsequence. Lines from file A before the common line are deleted, so we print them with the minus prefix. Lines from file B before the common line are added, so we print them with the plus prefix. Finally, we print the common line and repeat the process. Let's implement this idea. First, we find the longest common subsequence for the files A and B, then we iterate over each line in the longest common subsequence and print lines from file A with minus in the front until we reach the common line. We do the same for file B, but print lines with a plus. Finally, we can print the common line and repeat the process. After processing all common lines, we have to make sure to print the lines that come after the last common line as well. I'm going to run this function on the same two files so we can compare the output with the git diff. And this works! Isn't that great? We use dynamic programming to solve a real-life problem. It's worth noting that git diff actually uses Myers algorithm nowadays, which is more efficient, but we will discuss that another time. If you've enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and share it with your friends. It would help me grow this channel. Also, don't forget to subscribe. In the next video, 
we will look into another real-life problem that is solved with dynamic programming. See you next time.